To all the geeks and nerds, welcome to another episode of Dissecting Minecraft, and I'm here with Methods again. As usual, we are the Laurel and Hardy of Minecraft today. <laughs> oh, you love that, don't you? <laughs> And today, <laughs> and today, we are going to be talking about mob spawning. Yes. So uh, before we get into that, I'm just going to uh, say that uh, we're going to cover this subject in two episodes. So today's going to be more about the kind of theory behind it. And we're going to be talking about numbers and that kind of stuff. And then next week, we're going to look at some examples. And we're going to get into a bit more detail and show you some tools about how to create mob farms. All right. So that is the plan for this week and next. But before we get into mob spawning, we've got uh, some challenges to look at. So uh, we've got one here. This is from Okoy. So he uh, he sent one in uh, last week as well. So two weeks in a row. So well done, Okoy. And uh, the challenge for this week was to uh, create a flying machine that had a purpose, that had some kind of uh, practical uh, application. Um, so yeah, this is what he did. So these two machines are both his, and they uh, they create an ice way. So this is for your boat your 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 boat roads. Uh, so uh, do you want to talk about his methods or? There's not really much to talk about it, so instead of using the frosted ice boots here or the frostwalker boots directly to basically form infinite sources, he's using the waterlogged blocks, mm -hmm. which you can indeed move if you uh, use a less than three game tick pulse. Right. So at some point they, they fixed it, at some point they were completely movable, and then for some reason Mojang didn't like that and they tried to fix it, but they forgot about block dropping. Right. So if you have a sticky piston and it gets powered shortly enough that it block drops, then it will actually still move the water source with it. And use it. Right. And of course, those and those those, uh, those waterlogged blocks have to be just directly pushed by the piston. It can't be like via anything else. It has to else. be a piston pushing them directly, yes. You cannot yeah. attach them to slime or anything else. It has to be the piston itself block dropping it. Because yeah. only the block that's getting pushed directly by the piston is getting dropped. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So yeah, so basically there's this this flying machine that pushes these uh, these waterlogged blocks these waterlogged blocks along, and then you create this iceway. So this machine here gives you a one a one thick uh, iceway, and this machine gives you uh, two next to each other. So it's basically the same machine. But let's uh, let's kick these off and see if they work. Uh, hopefully I built it correctly. <laughs> let's find out. <laughs> there we go. So there's the flying machine moving along, and it's pulling this uh, frostwalker, uh, this uh, armistone frostwalker behind it, and that uh, that freezes the ice. And then, of course, yeah, the uh, as Method says, we push in these water blocks, which keeps the water moving. The, the beneficial part about this system here that's not using the frosted ice itself is you can make those way faster. So as we see here, this is a 10 game tick engine. Mm -hmm. And you can also use the, the Frostwalker boots themselves by basically making a frosted ice and then pulling the frosted ice forward. So it melts immediately, forms an infinite source, and then freezing it again, but it is a lot slower. I think that's like 19 game ticks per block if you do it fast, and this, mm. this is really the, the big advantage in those. Mm. But yeah, that's pretty cool. So uh, yeah, thanks for that, Akoi. Very good stuff. Yeah, so this this other one over here just works the same way, but this uh, kind of like two 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 stuck together. But uh, yeah, we will move on from that. And thanks to everyone else for for all the submissions. And uh, yeah, even if you're watching these episodes like in the future, then feel free to still put your post your um, post your challenges on there so we can have the, that that uh, kind of Reddit those Reddit threads. Uh, grow over time and they could be a good resource for other people uh, to take a look at. All right, so let's get on with the topic of the day and that is mob spawning. All right, so let's talk about mob spawning and we are inside uh, this uh, this glass sphere. So uh, I guess this is a good place to start. So Methods, do you want to kick it off? All right, so let's get started. So this glass block here where I'm standing right now will be our fixed point for the player. So if a player is standing here, mobs cannot spawn in a sphere around him for 24 blocks. And this is the green or lime sphere we're standing in here, mm. nothing can spawn inside here. And this includes the sphere itself. Right. And then the next sphere we have is the blue sphere. And this has a radius of 32 blocks. And this is the area where mobs can spawn, but cannot despawn. So anything that spawns inside here, yet again, including the blue glass itself, can spawn, but will never despawn since it's too close to the player. Mm -hmm. And then on the outside, we have the big red sphere. And it is a radius of 128. And this is the max distance mobs can spawn. Anything mm. further out than this will immediately despawn. Yeah. Now, this is a big old sphere. I think, uh, I think uh, a lot of the time, I think everyone forgets just how big this is. So if you think about that, that glass block just inside there, look at where that is, and a, a radius of 128 blocks in a sphere comes all the way out to here. This is actually quite a big area. 
Um, so we'll talk about um, things like mob farms and conditioning the area, things like that. But yeah, it's a big undertaking to uh, to deal with this area for sure. Oh yeah, and that's basically already it for all the ranges and conditions. Mm -hmm. So let's get over here to the side and talk a little bit about how the mob spawning algorithm actually works. So the mob spawning algorithm, it runs in this huge area around you, but mm -hmm. it doesn't run all the way up. It only checks up to the highest block that blocks skylight. Right. So that means if we, for example, place a stone block right here, mm -hmm. And for this block, it will only check up to the stone block here for the mob spawning algorithm. And over this, it will stop and no longer try to spawn mobs. And this is also seriously important mm -hmm. because um, it defines the chance that a spawn attempt is actually successful. Mm. So for every chunk in this area, it's the 15 by 15 chunk area centered on the player. It always checks what is the height. Mm -hmm. And then it says, okay, let's say our uh, lowest Y value possible would be Y1. Mm -hmm. Because a mob spawning attempt always needs a something to spawn on, so we cannot have a spawn attempt. We can have spawn attempts at Y zero, but they will never succeed. So Y one is the lowest mm -hmm. possible, mm -hmm. and that means we have a one in two chance that the spawn attempt succeeds. So let me just sorry, let me just interrupt you there. So the the height you're talking about that is that is per chunk or is that per block? Per block. Per block. Right. Okay. Per block. So right here we have a one in two chance that this mob spawn succeeds. Mm -hmm. And if we just place a block here, or let's say here, then this red stained glass block has a one in three chance to succeed a spawn attempt. Mm -hmm. Since it actually has a higher Y value, and therefore the it checks those two blocks here to spawn mobs and not only this one block. And this basically means it always increases by one. Mm -hmm. So if we have a at four, then we have a one in four chance. Five, we have a one in six chance. At six, we have a one in seven chance, and so on. So, at, for example, Y40, we have a one in 41 chance that a spawn attempt actually succeeds. Right. And so that, that's why when we build farms, there's a lot of talk of build it as low as possible in the world, and that's because your spawn attempts are more likely to succeed. Because every game tick in this 15 by 15 chunk area, there's three spawn attempts happening. Mm -hmm. So the lower you go, the higher is your chance your spawn attempt that's happening actually succeeds, mm -hmm. meaning the more mobs you get in the least amount of time. Right. That's very important. Okay, so the next thing. What happens when a spawn attempt actually succeeds? It selects a mob type to spawn. So mm -hmm. let's say right here where the lime stained glass block is, it selected a zombie. Mm -hmm. The conditions are all met. It has enough space. It's dark enough. It has a block it can actually spawn on which is mm -hmm. usually not a glass block, but we're using this here for demonstration. So when it comes to selecting a mob, how does it, what does it take into consideration when it picks a mob? So I imagine, so first of all, like the dimension is important and the biome is important. Um, dimension, like, the biome, the light level, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a slime chunk, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. And we will cover this more in the next episode as well. But let's just mm -hmm. say it's selected, it had a spawn attempt here on the Lime's stained glass block. It succeeded mm -hmm. and it selected a zombie. Mm -hmm. So now there's a thing called pack spawning. Mm -hmm. And that is basically, you don't see usually one zombie, you see multiples. And that is the most mobs, they have a pack size of four. And that means it can spawn up to four zombies. Right. So what happens? It selects the first zombie, it succeeds mm -hmm. the spawn attempt, and then it randomly goes five up to five blocks into X and Z direction. Mm -hmm. So that means it can go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And it could spawn another zombie here. I just marked them out with, with yellow blocks right now. So mm -hmm. let's say it spawned the next zombie here. Yep. And then it will do it again. Since our pack size is four, we only spawn two of them in. Yep. And then it will do it again. Let's say it spawns another zombie here. Mm -hmm. And then it can also spawn one more here. Yep. And every step it does here, it also checks the mob cap. So we have mob caps on the server, and that means you can maximum, as one player, have 70 hostile mobs at a time mm -hmm. in the game. It. And there's also different mob caps. There's a mob cap for hostile mob caps for mo hostile mobs. There's a mob cap for passive mobs. There's a mob cap for ambient mobs and for water mobs. We'll talk about them in a sec. Okay. But the important part is it always tries to wander up to five blocks far away, and then tries to do the pack spawn. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this also explains why you usually want to extend your roof outwards further than you need for the light level or even on the spawning layer itself. Because 
let's imagine this red chunk here is our mob farm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we do have those blocks here. Even though they are not spawnable since it's glass, it can still do the spawn attempts because they're not blocked by a full block or anything. Mm -hmm. And then it can say, I want to spawn them up here. And then it does all of this and that says, okay, well, it's glass, I'm failing. But mm -hmm. my pack spawn attempts can still happen. And then it goes five blocks over. Right. Still fails. And then it goes again five blocks over, let's say to here. And suddenly we are inside our mob farm and we can actually spawn a mob. Right. So even though and when therefore... it's doing so even though when it's doing the mob the, the pack spawning, uh, even though it's failing to spawn an actual mob on a space, it will continue until it's finished uh, going through the whole pack size. Exactly. As long as it's not hitting a solid full cube. Right. So let's say we spawn the zombie. Mm -hmm. We have a, a line of blocks here inside of our farm for whatever reason, wiring, or we just need this line of blocks here. And it hits the stone block, then it will immediately abort. Right. And that is the reason you never want solid blocks here at your feet level of the farm. You could use stairs or slabs, all kinds of things you can use there that aren't a full cube. And they will not block it, but those full solid opaque blocks will abort spawn events. Right. And so that's why we see, like, for example, in nether-based farms, we see uh, like a, a platform of leaves that come out from the out from the uh, the platform. So it, that can encourage extra spawns because of the, the pack exactly. spawning. Exactly, basically right? pulling pack spawn attempts from outside of our farm mm -hmm. into it. Right. Now we can't. So we, so when we say we're pulling them in, we we can't like force the pack to spawn this in this direction. But it gives us a chance for some extra spawns. Exactly, um, it's always just a chance that it, it goes from outside into your farm. Right. So you're basically just increasing the chances to get more mobs. And that's and that's the same reason for if you're doing like a like an overworld farm where you have a roof like a slab roof on top. So we have slabs because they're non-spawnable for start off. But also we normally extend the roof out. Is it like 15 blocks, something like that? Yeah, so normally that, you do 14 blocks out to right. to get Y level uh, light level zero. Yep. But it's actually beneficial to make it more. So most pack sizes are four for the hostile mm -hmm. mobs. That means you actually want 20 blocks extending. Right, 20 blocks extending. Since you can four right. times five blocks is 20. So if you go 20 blocks out, it checks the highest opaque block. So let's say our roof is here and we extend it to, let's just do it until here. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. So all of these blocks here up to this top block will do spawn attempts. Mm -hmm. And since there's nothing else here, they will not get aborted. And then they can actually wander inside of the farm. Right. So that's why we have the extended roof. So so normally we'd have slabs, but it's the same difference. So the pack spawning, and even though it's just air here, they, they would fail because there's, there's the, the block it picks is not a block that's spawnable, but the pack the pack size, the pack spawning will continue until it's gone through every, everything in that in that side in that pack size. Exactly. Yeah, okay. That's great. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, and that's also the whole shenanigan about the leaves and how you extend that. And let's just talk about some other random information that's very important. Mm -hmm. So mob caps. If we just do in the chat slash spawn mob caps, we can see they're a little bit different now because we are two players, but we will explain mm -hmm. this right now. Okay. So we have the monster mob cap. This is all the hostile mob caps like zombies, spiders, skeletons, all of that stuff that attacks you. That is usually, if you're alone, 70 mobs. Yep. And we have the creatures that is passive mobs like horses, pigs, chickens, basically animals. Mm -hmm. There's a mob cap of 10. Then we have the ambient mob, which is basically only the bat. Mm -hmm. That's also 10. No, sorry, it's 15. Mm -hmm. Got changed to 13. And then we have the water creatures. Those are squids and fishes. Mm -hmm. And those are also 15. Mm -hmm. So now every player has adds to the mob cap. Since we're right now, we're in the same chunk it only gets added a little bit. So it goes from 70 to 85, from mm -hmm. 10 to 12, from 15 to 18, and from 15 to 18 again. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, But the more chunks that we both load, the higher the mob cap gets. So if I move two chunks far away, and we do spawn mob cap again, we are now at a mob cap of 96 mm -hmm. for the hostile mobs. Right. And if I move even further away, it will go even further. And if I move really far away really quickly, we will see that it's now actually double. And it's also not player specific. So mm -hmm. for example, if I'm now here in this huge glass area and you have a huge stone area, you will get 140 mobs. It's not based on the player. Right. And that also explains why a lot of people on multiplayer servers always have problems with their farms not really spawning the mobs you see in the video. Mm -hmm. So that means basically 
I'm in my perfect condition perimeter. Mm -hmm. I have a mob farm with, let's say, 1,000 spawning spaces for mobs to actually spawn. And it, it works super good. And then you suddenly lock in in a normal area and you have 75,000 valid spawning spaces around you. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, my spawning spaces cannot compete with you. Yeah, yeah. And you basically get 138 mobs and I get two. Yeah, I think so. That, I think that's one of the one of the number one comments that I get on some of the farm videos that I've done is that people say that like uh, I've built this farm and it's not working, and yep. I can guarantee it's one of the two reasons. It's either uh, the the area around hasn't been conditioned properly, so there's lots of uh, spawning spaces outside of the farm, so mobs are spawning outside of the farm instead of inside it. And then the other reason is like you said, just said there, it's on a multiplayer server and other players are filling the mob cap, and that's again why you don't get uh, get mobs spawning inside exactly. the farm. Exactly. There's one more very common problem, and that is your render distance. Right. So if you go below render distance 10, as we know, mobs can spawn up to 128 blocks far away from you. Mm -hmm. If you go below render distance 10, they can actually spawn inside of lazy chunks, ah. which then they will not no longer despawn since they're lazy loaded. And that basically makes it so you over time create a mob switch around yourself. Right. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so the, so the moral of that is, if you can uh, have at least a render distance of ten. <laughs> yeah, have a render distance of ten and have a properly conditioned perimeter, and mm -hmm. tell the people to lock off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's good. Okay, so that was basically here. The mob cap is shared with all players, no matter of position. That basically means no matter where you are and I am, we both share the mob cap, mm -hmm. and it gets basically if we load the same area, it gets up by fifteen, and if we load our own areas, it gets double. Okay, And there's a nice little uh, mathematical thingy on the wiki where you can actually calculate exactly the each chunk I move away, how far it goes up. But it's fairly complicated and really trippy. Okay, Okay. then another very important fact, mobs cannot spawn inside of other entities. Mm. What does that mean? A mob cannot spawn inside of another mob or a minecart or an armor stand or things like this. Right, and, that, and that, that's a change in 1.13, I think. Is that right? That is a change in 1.13. That one, up to 112, they actually from 19 to 112, they spawned inside of each other. Mm. Okay, then another fact mobs cannot spawn in a radius of 24 blocks around the original world spawn. Right, yes. Which a lot of people don't know. <clears throat> yes, so if you start building a, a mob farm at your spawn point, then, uh, or your, your world spawn, then you're going to have some issues. <laughs> a lot of people, for example, um, open a creative world and start messing around with mob farms and do not move away. And right. then they wonder why they have really low rates, and it's usually because they're right at world spawn. Right. So make sure you move two chunks far away from where you spawned in at least. <laughs> okay, then basically a bunch of standard stuff. Uh, hostile mobs, excluding slimes, need light level 7 or lower to spawn in. Mm -hmm. And it excludes most nether mobs, besides uh, wither skeletons. So because the nether obviously has a lot of lava, mm -hmm. pigmen and blazes and gas, they all ignore, completely ignore light level. They do not care. Yep. Besides blazes, they actually do care. Uh, it has to be above light level 11. Yep. Okay. Then another fact. Besides water mobs, all mobs need two blocks of headspace. Mm. So what does that mean? I have this little thingy built up here. Maybe let's just move it to here to make it a little bit more accessible. So let's imagine a bat wants to spawn here. Mm -hmm. Here it can actually spawn, yep. and here it can't. So even though the bat is really small, the game always checks for this headspace here. And if it's a glass block, or a slab, or a hopper, or a leaf block, or something like that, that isn't a full cube and not opaque, then it can actually spawn here. Mm -hmm. So a, a bat can spawn here. But if it's a full block and it is opaque, it cannot spawn here even though it would actually fit. It still checks this whole area. Okay, and that's the same for the spiders as well, I think, right? Exactly. So a spider could spawn here, but it couldn't spawn here. Right. Now, the other question here, uh, which might be applicable, is baby zombies. So I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, th I don't think baby zombies would spawn here because when it comes to baby zombies, uh, the game picks uh, a mob to spawn first, which is the zombie, and then it would pick uh, a variant of that if, if it could spawn. So we wouldn't exactly. get so it basically does here. the whole spawning algorithm. It says, "I want to spawn a zombie. Can I fit here?" And for it for a zombie to fit, it actually needs the the space. Yep. 
and then it does the pick spawning and everything and right before it finishes everything it says like okay what type of zombie am i actually going to be i'm going to be a baby yeah so it could be a baby could be a villager could be a normal zombie right i think uh, zombie villagers actually have their own little thingy since 1.13 ah okay so that is no longer here zombie villagers also have a smaller pack size than normal zombies now ah, okay so for example normal zombies can spawn up to a pack of four mobs uh, zombie villagers only one okay Okay. Then again, mobs need a solid top surface and an opaque block to spawn. So what does that basically mean? It means mobs cannot spawn on chests. Mobs cannot spawn on a bottom slab since it mm -hmm. does not have a solid top surface. Yeah. So, things so like, let's just get a quick example out. So things like repeaters and this here has a solid top surface. Mm -hmm. Because you can see it's flat, solid, it's full block size basically. Mm -hmm. This here doesn't. Yep. Then the glass now, the glass has a solid top surface, but it's not opaque. Mm -hmm. And that basically defines what a mob can spawn on. Mm -hmm. And what about bedrock? And bedrock and barrier blocks are two exceptions to this whole thingy. Bedrock and barrier blocks are both specifically made spawn proof, even though they are solid and opaque okay. and have a solid top surface. Okay, this of course excludes water mobs. Mm -hmm. We will talk a little bit more about spawn conditions for those in the next video because they're very specific and there's different ones for different water mobs. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it, yeah, it also excludes bed. Okay, then we have passive mobs. Passive mobs, like animals, they need light level 9 or higher. And they need grass to spawn on. And it excludes mushrooms. Mushrooms need mycelium, but still light level 9. Okay. Also, another interesting fact is passive mobs don't use this hostile spawning algorithm that we just talked about. They use a completely different one, and that only happens every 400 game ticks. Right. So every 20 seconds it tries to spawn in passive mobs. Right. So that's but why... We'll also cover this in the next episode way more in-depth. Right. So how exactly it works. So, this is, so that's why in your world you're going to be covered when it's nighttime. You're, you're surrounded by lots of mobs, but not... Uh, well, lots of hostile mobs, but not many, uh, not many passive mobs. Uh, in a normal world, you don't see passive mob spawning at all. That's right. Okay. So in a normal world, there's also there's always your spawning conditions for for passive mobs. Like passive mobs can respawn, mm -hmm. but they also generate with the world. So if you generate a chunk, and let's say it's in a plains biome, it can generate pigs or chickens. Ah, uh, right. And that usually means in a normal world that you do not specifically condition. You always have more than ten. Right. Since the passive mob cap is only ten mobs, that's basically always there. Right, I see. Unless you specifically condition your world for this. So when when those passive mobs uh, generate with the chunks, do they check the mob cap at the time, or do they just spawn anyway? They completely ignore. Ah, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, and then lastly, the Minecraft wiki I wanted to mention. They have a really nice uh, spawn tab. It's a little bit outdated for 1.13, but the whole conditions part of it, the spawn conditions, is still very accurate. Mm -hmm. And I would highly recommend you check this out because there's a lot of information for each and every single mob, what exactly they need, how exactly they spawn in, and what conditions they have to use. Okay, we, we'll, we'll, we'll get a link in the description uh, to that. So yeah, go and exactly. check that out. Just make sure you ignore all the algorithm parts and everything, just the spawning conditions. Because it's a little bit odd. Okay. Yeah, that's basically it for today. All right, awesome. All right, so that is about it for this episode of Dissecting Minecraft. Now this week, uh, we're not going to give you a challenge uh, like, a, like a normal homework challenge that we have done before, uh, because this is just all been theory based, um, but there will be one next week. Uh, but uh, for this week, I think what we want to do is we want to encourage you to give us as many questions as possible uh, in the comments. Uh, let's just make sure that we've, un that we've explained this in a way that all makes sense. So if there's anything that didn't make any sense, or if we've missed anything out, then get those, get those questions in the comments. And what we'll do next week is we'll cover as many of those as we can uh, before we do delve into, uh, into more details. All right, so if you enjoyed the episode and it was useful, then please hit the like button. And if you are new, then feel free to subscribe. And if you've got any comments or suggestions or any more than what I just asked about, then get it in the comment section. All right, my geeks, until next time, I will see you later. Bye-bye.